I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the series A Very British Scandal with actress Claire Foy. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about one of the things that you said that was challenging in terms of this role is there are some similarities to your to your character in The Crown, even though they're very different characters in terms of, of the dialect and the affectation and the speech. And that one of the challenges was trying to not overplay the differences and yet to still find the similarities. And so I was really interested in how you found that space in between so perfectly for this role. Um, it was a real struggle, if I'm honest. Um, I think I, I hadn't, I wasn't expecting to be playing another woman of that period of time who was also kind of um not aristocratic because margaret wasn't but but for want of a better word posh really like moved in a particular type of circle had a particular upbringing um i just hadn't really expected that i would be doing that within the next kind of 25 years um uh but she, her character was so kind of interesting to me and and sarah's script was so great that although I had so many reservations and I was like, I'm not entirely sure that I um, relish this opportunity because it, because it does become like minute details and you do wonder as well if the audience will even pick up on them or whether you'll completely miss the mark. Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I've never really thought about how much of a technical actor I am or if I even am one. So um, it was pretty, I didn't necessarily enjoy that side of it because it, it took me out of myself a bit too much and things like that. But it was um, it was interesting. It was, you know, because I think it, it, a lot of that period is really interesting when it comes to the clothes, because regardless of who you, it, you know, in my head, if a heel is a certain height, then you're a certain type of person. <laughs> in my head, this is a lot about you as who you are. And um, things like the fashion and the hairstyles and things like that, they're very aging and they're also um, very indicative of the period. It wasn't a that massively sexed up era, um, in, unless you were a Hollywood movie star, I suppose, in that way. Um, and so, yeah, so those things as well, you kind of want to be able to express this character to a modern audience and make them understand her freedom or who she was. And if she was alive today, that would be completely different. But because of the restrictions of the period of time and the dress and the way she behaved on the outside. Yeah, it was, I did find it, I did find it tricky. And in terms of, of the way that she dressed and the way that she projected herself on the outside, she was someone who very much had cultivated an image with the media, with the press, very specifically, um, you know, was kind of always one, one step ahead in terms of the image that she was shaping. And then at the same time, you get to really deliciously look at the moments behind closed doors and, and what that looked like. And so it feels like there's almost two different versions that you get to look at within this character, who she wants to project herself as in the public eye, and then who she is when the doors are closed and nobody else is in the room with her and what were the main differences that you found that you really loved exploring between those two spaces yeah I mean I think she pretty much thought she got it licked in the sense that the press loved her the dynamic with them was very simple and I think it was at that period of time anyway it was very much you know uh a restrained you know respectful distance I scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of thing it wasn't particularly seedy or underhand or you know a, uh, seemingly from from her point of view anyway uh, and she was adored and um lauded and kind of everything she did was important she was the most fashionable the most glamorous the most um appreciated and although it was a very cultivated like exterior um you know she had her first perm when she was like seven years old or something that her mum um like her mum was very very particular about how her daughter would look and you know said things that she, basically she was you know the only good thing about her was the way she looked like everything else was completely rubbish so I, so it was a very like the, the how she came across just aesthetically was incredibly important to her um, and everything else that happened wasn't really that important because of how you looked, um, she was never going to be asked her opinion or anything. So, uh, she, yeah, she kind of figured that that was all sorted and fine. And so when she goes into, you know, the court of public opinion, which is her divorce case and 
um, and suddenly she's not in charge of the narrative and she's not pulling the strings and she's not able to rely on that adoration from the press. Um, I think she's surprised by it, but I don't think that she thinks they're right or that it's the right thing to happen. I think she thinks probably that everybody's deluded and how could everybody possibly think that she's this sort of person? Um, and I think the things that in private, you know, I loved moments that Anne managed to capture, which were was her vanity, which was her, you know, having books with clip, like clippings of her her press clippings in that she did herself um and that she was bored I think that she was fundamentally bored and chased excitement and travel and challenge and um and she wasn't the sort of person who'd sit down and read a book she, you know, even when she was in Inverera, she had, you know, she set up a small cinema, she hosted parties, you know, she had to be doing something. And if she wasn't occupied by doing something, she would be doing something else. So, um, so yeah, she was, she was a restless creature. And in pulling together all those details, you obviously did an incredibly extensive amount of research in in a variety of different ways. You know, there there's video clips where you can watch her, kind of like see how she speaks. You can listen to her. You know that you listen to a lot of tapes that she had recorded as voice memos mm. for for a ghost written novel. Um, and then also there's all of the things that have been written about her. And those that side of things is quite interesting because obviously the media and everything that's written about her comes in with an opinion and a viewpoint of who she is as well and then you know we kind of know that she was sometimes a little fluid with the truth as well so even the things that she's saying you know have a bit of a perspective on them and so given that there is kind of this unknowable space still even with all of the research material available did that kind of give you a certain freedom of interpretation with her as a character if you're like well the truth lays somewhere in the middle and that's what I can kind of play around with finding yeah I think mm I found that quite comfortable making. Um, I don't like to be like, you know, loosey goosey. I like to kind of know the linchpins of what I'm doing, just so I feel safe, basically. Even if that means that then you can be spontaneous and um, and change things around, it comes from a point of like, not fact, but truth, I suppose. And, and that you're not, especially when you're playing a real person, you don't want to um, be inaccurate or, um kind of fast and loose with the truth I think I think it's really important to the emotions and 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 things like that can be completely dramatic because it is a drama you know it doesn't have it's not a documentary but I think that you have to base them in some sort of foundation of reality but you're right you know the, the space in between um I realized a certain point you know, I think in the first couple of weeks of shooting it, that basically the space in between was where the audience had to live and I had to allow the audience to interpret her behaviour and who she was. I couldn't kind of lead them really in any particular way because the facts of her is who she, her behaviour is indicative enough of her character and that she lied so much that she sort of pathologically seemed to lie, that she um, was incapable of sort of helping herself that she would that she would go to an nth degree to prove she was right about something that she wasn't right about um she could have never wanted to lose face and all those sorts of things like I I I had to accept that at a certain point the audience would know those things see what was happening on screen and make up their own mind about her um her motivations because I think every time I kind of thought, oh, that's why she does it, I'd then do something else and be like, no, it's, that, that can't be right because she's doing something completely different in this bit. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's where I basically put that. I put it in the audience's hands to kind of put her together, really, because she, she was genuinely, like, one of the most difficult people that I've played, I think, for that reason. 
And in regards to her motivations as well, you were talking a little bit about her relationship with her mother before. Um, but I've also heard you mention that actually a, a big inroad to the character was the was the relationship that she had with her father and how that informed a lot of the interactions that she had with men, um, the importance of validation yeah. from, from men in her life as well. Um, what were kind of the key components that you built into the character or found in terms of a lot of her motivations that stemmed from reading about that relationship a lot? Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's her relationship with men is it's less about there's so much in it that is motivated by her desire, which I think gives her a lot of autonomy and also um, uh, is very interesting about her chasing it. She's not chasing something in desperation and she's not engaging in relations with men because she's desperate and needy and she only finds you know comfort outside of herself but I think it's it was instilled in her very young that her father was the kind one and her mother was the sort of authoritarian kind of strict um judgmental not very safe place and it's obvious from the stories about her and even the way she talks herself about women that women were not her safe place um she find solace with women she hated going to an all-girls school um I don't think she found a lot of competition with women in the sense that I think she found most women to be not as great as she is um uh, so I think she found them quite dull um and the company of men was much more interesting to her and I think that's because with her father she, that's where she got love from and that's where she got everything from he gave her everything there was sort of no limit to what he, you know, monetarily would give her. There was no limit to how much he would indulge her with, you know, things like when she was little, like her toys and um, her dogs. And, you know, she just was indulged. And so her attraction to men and kind of her, the sexual relationship that she had with men, I think was very much based on romance but it was also a very safe place for her to live and be, was with men and to be admired by men. I think she knew exactly how to push their button. She knew exactly how to get what she wanted out of them. And that's the problem is basically Ian is not that. And his own demons mean that he's not easily manipulated or, or um, kind of one round. And I think that that's why you sort of see the naivety in her then because she's sort of confused. She's not disbelieved, like she's not like um, there's something wrong. You know, it would be that there's something wrong with this man. She wouldn't, she just wouldn't get it. She'd be like, she'd try the same thing over and over and over again. She'd never try a new tack. Like it would always be just, well, this worked once. I'll just try this again, you know? Um, but yeah, I did find that really fascinating about her. And, um, and I did love, I've never really played a like a daddy, daddy, daddy girl before. Um, and I'm very much a woman's woman. Like I love, you know, that's where I, so it was really interesting to, to be daddy. It was just really, I just found it quite funny. <laughs> quite a lot of the time. She obviously, you know, was an incredibly confident woman. Um, and, and I was interested in the space of that in regards to her stammer. And you actually consulted with someone from the Stammering Association. And that was one of the things that they kind of shared is people always think that if you have a stammer, that it makes you quite shy, but that's not the case. And, and you know, you can be very extroverted at the same time. Um, and I love that you had the opportunity to explore something like that within the character. And it's also something that, you know, she's had since childhood and has spent a lot of time kind of learning how to suppress in different ways um, and so what were kind of the small ways in which you wanted that to be a part of her character yeah that was another thing that was really interesting and sort of tricky to track because when I spoke to this amazing woman from the Stammers Association she was it was really interesting like I said what's the worst thing I can do basically um, for the stammering community <laughs> how could I make this terrible and she was her thing was that I, that she would be defined by it and that really struck a chord with me because I feel like um, Margaret isn't defined by it it's like a 
by the by thing that people sort of mention every once in a while in books about her. But she, she also had a stammer. Like it's not really dwelled on at all. And even in the tapes, there's only, you know, in eight hours of these tapes of her talking, there's only one occasion when she stammers uh, noticeably and it's not even noticeable. And I think that she developed a, like a lot of people do um, uh, with any kind of way that they express themselves with speech um, that instead of they navigate them around it. Um, and it's really interesting talking to her about the difference between men and women who have a stammer um, and women basically shapeshift. And, and I think what a lot of people do is avoid the trigger words, just find different ways. Instead of struggling through it, they find different ways of getting around it so that a lot of people just don't ever know. They call them secret stammerers, that a lot of people never know that that's a really big thing for them. Um, and I think for her, it was really fascinating because... I think she does live, sorry, that's my dog whining. Um, she does live in um, a physical world. She feels more comfortable in the physical world. I don't, she's not a great wit. She's not going to talk to you about the politics of the day. She is only comfortable in certain situations. And if not, she's very happy to sit there and be adored because of the way she looks physically. So um, I did find that really interesting. And, I, and it was really insightful when she said that, you know, a lot of people think that if you're, you're, you're a stammerer, it's because you have trouble expressing yourself in some way. And so a lot of the time it's complete opposite. And there is an extrovert who is not necessarily being blocked, but that there is an extrovert and, and that they will find them, their way of expressing themselves in whatever way they can, really. Um, and I thought that really rung true with her as well, because there is a, an element to her of, from a very young age, she wasn't allowed to be who she was. And so that's a, meant her, made her express herself in different ways. And, you know, in another realm with her confidence as well, with everything that she goes through with the media and the way that she's treated, I thought it was interesting to hear you describe it, that, that her spirit was broken, wasn't broken, but her confidence was, you know, and we see that defiance all the way through, but you can also see the undercurrent of, you know, this does impact her. This does, you know, it would anybody being treated that way and, and written that way in the press. Um, and so how did you kind of see that delineation between her spirit and her confidence and the fact that she is still kind of pushing forward in one regard and at the same time, you know, breaking inside a little bit in another regard? Yeah, I think it, it was all based on the, her, basically her lack of understanding of what was happening, I think. I just think she was very naive and she could never quite believe things weren't going her way um, and was hoping they'd write themselves, but they never did, um, really. But then I think she just got very good at ignoring those elements and she basically created her own narrative. I mean, it's really extraordinary to hear her there's this one bit in these, um, they do talk about the blackmailing of Ian, or at least the kind of defamation case of like her, her saying that his kids weren't his. And she does talk about that, but in very hushed tones, very sort of off the record. And it is played through her own, she told herself. And it's amazing to hear someone um, believe their own lie in that way. Um, and I think she probably just did that over and over. You know, there were, would have been thousands of newspaper articles about the Dirty Duchess, and then she would probably find one where she looked fabulous in a fur coat, cut that out, and that would be the story she'd tell herself, that she'd still be adored. I mean, I might be wrong, but I just, I just feel like she at home weeping about oh my god what's happened I don't know whether she was capable of having a dark night of the soul and and looking at it and going oh my god maybe I'm so privileged um that I'm so blinkered and I have been treated in an appalling way and maybe that should be what I fight for or that's what I should fight against but I just don't believe that she would have done that I believe that she would have had a couple of friends around had some champagne and been basically, you know, 
I don't know whether I can swear, but like, you know, don't believe the haters. Like that's, you know what I mean? I think that's basically what she would have done, <laughs> which I think is, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that she's an incredibly moral and, uh, you know, to be emulated, but I do, still do admire that. I still do admire that sort of human spirit. She's like, you know, you can't, she's not going to be kept down. She just won't be because of her own belief. And also she's like, my life is what I tell her myself it is. I'm like, good, good for her. <laughs> I kind of love that that detail in her as well. And and also when you step back and you look at your performance through these episodes, what's quite remarkable is that it's really only three episodes and the amount of space and time and aspects that you cover in terms of character and story is so much. I mean, you get to look at the initial meeting, the romanticism in this relationship, you know, what it was at the beginning and then the complete disillusion of this into, you know, that, that place of pure conflict and nothing else by the end and then everything through the media. And that's obviously as well over the span of several years, what were the challenges that came with having a limited amount of time to tell a story with such breadth and scope and making sure that you were really kind of giving full service to each of these moments and each of these kind of evolutions in her as a character, as she grows and evolves throughout the story. It was pretty tough. I think, um, in all honesty, um, Paul had to be on it quite a lot because we were moving through periods of time and because the scripts were fluid in the sense that time wasn't really a concept in them. Um, and we worked very closely with the makeup department, with the incredible makeup department and the costume department, basically ourselves, to make sense of that. So that the creators, basically, so that Anne Zewitsky, the director, um, the one job that she didn't <laughs> also have to do on top of everything else. Um, but it did make it quite hard. And there were a couple of tricky days when um, we realised fundamentally we were in the wrong room at the wrong time in the wrong costume with the wrong people and we were like um oh dear everyone um but you know that's making a show I think um especially probably in Covid and things like that so there were a couple of days where that was really tricky um and I think that I hadn't really done anything like that before so I had to be really clear with myself what the beats were what the evolutionary changes for her character were um where and what became the linchpin was basically where they were in their relationship because at a certain point I realized that was the going to be basically the fulcrum of the whole thing and she was always going to be who she was and if you could tell the story through the dynamic of their relationship and at what point in their relationship things were good or bad or they, you know, rekindled some sort of weird, strange, sadomasochistic romance, you know, whatever that was, that would be the way of showing the passing of time, but also showing the evolution of both of their characters. And I think me and Paul both realised that. So we did a lot of work, you know, end of each day in the car home, there'd be phone calls going, OK, tomorrow, what are we doing? And what, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, and I couldn't, yeah, we, I couldn't have done that without him because he was so invested in it as well. And so interested and present and um but it was a real it was a real challenge <laughs> and in a weird way I kind of love that you were describing their relationship as being very sadomasochistic there because there is so much contemption between the two of them and obviously as we see on screen it it does also turn violent and from both of them you know there's that breaking point for her where she hits him after he makes a comment about her father but then he obviously takes it so many steps further in, in kind of like pinning her down and holding her down on the bed and that scene in particular mm -hmm felt like a huge turning point and that kind of felt like the end of the road for both of them like there's no walking backwards from everything that happens in that moment um how did the two of you approach finding all of the delicacy in that scene all of the contention that comes you know there's still that kind of weird undercurrent of love even in a moment like that from all the history that they have with one another and yet we're also seeing you know the beginning of an end of a relationship happen right in front of our eyes yeah, I mean, I think they are both very much engaged in that process. You know, neither of them are passive and both are very active in that destruction of that relationship and also the physical element of it. 
he obviously um that was the really that was a really interesting conversation that we all had um basically because of legal reasons we could only shoot that scene from the outside so we could because it was an basically someone second hand account had said that that is what happened and that's how he treated her and there was you know on more than one occasion something like that happened in their relationship they would be in France and someone would be outside the room and hear furniture being thrown and screaming and you know things like that and so there was more than enough evidence that he was abusive but because of legal ramifications we couldn't show him being abusive you could only show the actions that ultimately you know he did have his hands around her throat at one point someone saw that so we could put that in it but we couldn't put the interim in it what happened in between was she engaged in the fight was with him or you know where did that go so that was the how we managed to show was that she started it basically that she so that the implication is that they, she tried to give as good as she got but basically she never was going to be able to because he was a giant and far stronger than she was and also far more um damaged I suppose in that in that way um um I mean I'm I think that, that for me as as the actor in the scene, I just realized how scary that must have been when the game goes too far. You know, it's all fine when thing that everyone knows what the rules are, but when people the rules aren't there anymore and it's very much um I think she gets very afraid of him at that point. Like I think it, she's genuinely scared of him. And being scared is something that she's not very comfortable with and it makes her feel quite vulnerable. And she doesn't do well with sympathy at that point. Um, even though she loves people's sympathy, <laughs> you know, she loves having people say, oh, poor Margaret. You know, I think that at that point she's like, no, I don't want this because then it's real, isn't it? Um, and I think you're right. I think that there is no going back for them at that point and I think that even for her she's lied to herself about the romantic romantic notion of their relationship and who they are for each other for such a long time that then I think the point gets to where she's like okay well we're not going to be able to be live together anymore but we'll just be married and lived in separate houses and I'll have my lovers and you'll have your lovers and we'll keep up the appearance like I think that she the the uh, the fairy tale idea that they could still be the Duke and Duchess and be happy is long gone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's those scenes you can only do in like a safe environment and with an actor who's you know is um, in control and with you. Um, and that's what Paul is. So, uh, and 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 Anne was Anne, Anne was really up for. The messiness of it and the reality of what it is like to be in a relationship where both partners can be engaged in violence with each other whether that is physical or mental um and i they both do their fair amount of it so i think um whilst it was sort of awful to have to shoot um it was really important to the, their story and, and their marriage and stuff Absolutely. Well, it's a really, really remarkable performance throughout the series. And so it's genuinely been such a pleasure hearing all of these details of everything that went into it. So congratulations on the series and thank you so much, Claire. Oh, thanks for having me.